Hey everybody. Good evening. I'll wait a little bit and see if anybody shows up here. I uh, was trying to launch a live stream a few minutes ago. Some of you may have seen it, but I was having some encoding issues. So we decided to uh, relaunch it and see if we could use the that internal thing that YouTube has that's in beta that non-technical people, you know, are uh, relegated to using. So I say, hey, we have eight people here, 14 people here. Nice to see you all. I have a very classy mug. I don't think you can even buy these anymore. So, yeah, I've been meaning to do live streams for quite a while, um, but it's it's one of those things that I'm, I'm, I'm a better gardener than techie, so I always look at it and go, hmm, I don't know if I really want to figure that out, so. Thank you guys for being patient. I, we've decided to do, um, you know, relaunch and do all kinds of videos again. Now that we've got some land, instead of kind of like where we are right now, we're renting. So we don't actually have a yard. And so we were borrowing that lot and building on that lot and using like using this lot, building gardens on, not building a house. We can't afford it. Like, honestly, the quarter acre that we've been gardening on is like, it's near the ocean, so it's like $100,000 US for it if we wanted to buy it for a quarter acre of like mud and broken bottles. And but the land is flat there. So that, and the the land's flat, so it's like the Florida. Was good. The $100,000 for a quarter acre is also like Florida. But um, anyhow, since we got the new land, Rachel's like, look it, we're going to do it, and um, I'm going to help you. So it was nice to see you guys. Let's see, we've got some comments here. Hey, everybody. Um, so, yeah, so we've decided to relaunch the YouTube thing and try to make more videos. And Rachel was like, we just have to do it because look at, we're going to clear a lot. We're going to build a house. We're going to, you're going to actually get to see gardening from scratch. And the funny thing is, is that my, you know, my YouTube channel was just taking off uh, as I was leaving my productive homestead. I mean, some of you guys who have followed my blog for a long time, I started at uh, floridasurvivalgardening.com. That was my original blog, and that started in, I think, uh, 2011. And then that became thesurvivalgardener.com a few years later. And I cataloged, you know, like doing a post every weekday. I've done it for years. I've had a post almost every weekday. A couple of times we dropped off, but uh, a couple of times we added a few more. So it's been very close to every weekday. And, you know, our old food forest, um, I had a plant nursery in the backyard. I had, a, it was, I, by the time we left, it was a six-year-old coming up on seven-year-old food forest. People would come from, as a way to come tour it. And then suddenly, like, my YouTube channel is taking off, and I don't have anything to show. It's ridiculous. So, hey, New York, Virginia. Tim, you just got my book, Start a Home-Based Nursery. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, Colleen, when are we getting our house built? That's a good question, because I honestly don't know how to build a house. So, um. I'm, I'm, I'm working on getting utilities hooked up right now. I've got to get some the electric and the water out there, and I'm going to get some water catchment. I mean, honestly, I just bought the land so I could garden. I guess I could probably live in a tent or something. What do you think? Do I want to live in a tent? Yeah. There was a time when I wanted to live in a tent, honestly. Honest to goodness, I That's did. right. When, but, we were, when we were dating, you said that, wouldn't it be fun to yeah, just like live in a tent and camp at different places? Different, yeah. But then yeah. we had children. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had children. Hi, <laughs> right, Guam. Nice. Cincinnati. Starting a homestead in Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, we used to live in Tennessee. Yeah, there's some very good soil there. The only thing that was really hard about Tennessee, for me, coming from Florida, was the, the rainy, cold winters. I mean, that was like the frozen north for me. I might as well have been inside the Arctic Circle. And, uh, yeah, that was rough. And, and then when, when spring would come, my allergies were absolutely incredible. I never had allergies before like I had there. It was like everything decided to breed all at the same time. And there was just like drifts of pollen everywhere. I'm like, yes, it's finally warm. Everything's green. I'm going to go guard. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was a fun way. So I, uh, I, I'm going to get to uh, what we're talking about. We've got 55 people here now. Um, back when I was running the the plant nursery, probably some of you guys actually came by. I used to advertise on the blog when I was going to be at the farmer's markets. So we ran, we ran it 
Um, we didn't really sell out of our yard all that much. We ran it out of the farmer's markets. And when I say make thousands in your spare time, that's true. We made thousands. We didn't make millions. Uh, but we didn't make hundreds either. I mean, it was a few hundred bucks a week, but it was usually over a thousand a month. So that was actually, it was good compared to the time that we put into it. So um, I thought I would just um, answer anybody's questions if they've got questions about starting a nursery, selling plants or any of that sort of thing. And I'll, I'll take other questions later. But um, the what I discovered there are okay there are a lot of little nurseries like you can go to any farmers market and see people selling plants out of the back of their car you can see people selling by the side of the road out of the back of their car and i would say most of those people are making next to nothing because i i watched what people were doing and how they were selling and how they priced and how they marketed and they were not turning things over as a matter of fact some of the like the other vendors at the farmers market would look at me and go how did you make money today? You know, like nobody's making money today. I ma I made twenty dollars. What did you make? And I'm like, I was taking home you know two hundred fifty or something like that for being there for uh, a half a day. You know, four hours, two hundred fifty bucks. It was pretty good. Um, and that would be on a you know a bad day. I would have I would have days where I would break um, four hundred and four hours of selling at a plant nursery. And this right now. This was a little teeny weeny farmer's market too. I did the, uh, the 326 community market, which was in Ocala and ran for a few years. It's unfortunately shut down now. Um, but and it's probably because I left, honestly. <laughs> I don't want to give myself too much credit. There were some good vendors there. But uh, yes, do you need a permit to sell plants? As I write in the book, um, the government overlooks a lot of stuff. Like if you're just selling by the side of the road at a garage sale and you propagated some stuff, um, you're probably not going to get pinged. They're just going to be like, ah, this is some guy's selling out of his, you know, selling by the side of the road. But as soon as you want to go to the farmer's market or as soon as you, like people start knowing you as a nursery or you advertise as a nursery, if you want to put your nursery, you know, an ad into the local news or whatever, they start asking like, like everybody is supposed to ask, where's your license? In Florida, the licensing process is quite easy. It's just a matter of having your little nursery space inspected. I was scared to, to do it. I mean, Rachel can tell you, like I, I, I have a visceral fear of involving the government in anything. I mean, I remember at one time looking up the food stamp program when we didn't have a lot of money and I was like, you know what? I would rather starve than fill out this paperwork. I'm gonna go plant another garden bed. Um, but, you know, it's it's just, you know, you go and you pay your little, it's like a $25 fee for the year. You also, it helps to register. Um, I have an accountant who deals with the IRS stuff. And so what I did was I hired her to make an S corporation, Florida Food Forest Incorporated. I'm still incorporated in the state of Florida actually right now. Um, and that in, little in, incorporation allows you to write off everything on your taxes, which is a huge help. Like the amount of money I spent to incorporate and to hire the accountant was more than made up for. If you just go and sell plants, boom, it comes back on you. Um, every expense that you've ever done, if it's just you selling, it's hard to get the write-offs. But when you have a corporation, it's not hard at all. Do you suppose it's different per, I mean, I know it's different per state. Do you suppose it's different per county as well? Yeah, it does. Uh, somebody somebody wrote me and they said, oh, man, alive. You know, I live in, I can't remember where it was, it's Missouri or Mississippi. Um, but they said, you know, they lived in another state from Florida and they said they have to go through a, like a one-year program in order to start a plant nursery. And um, somebody else commented, well, you you know, there's workarounds for that sort of thing. What you do is you go work for somebody else's plant nursery and maybe you can get a blanket under the license and sell alongside them for a time until you get your, you know, get it up. Uh, and going like the way you want it to appropriately to the law or whatever. Um, and it does vary from state to state. But the if you call the agricultural extension office and say, hey, I want to start a plant nursery, you can ask them. And, and often even better is just to go to a working nursery and say, oh, I see you guys are selling, um, you know, you're like agaves are us. You sell nothing but agave plants. 
and I would like to start a, uh, a, a nursery selling orchids, right? So, I mean, don't go to somebody like, oh, you have an orchid nursery. I want to start an orchid nursery. I actually want to start one right next to you. Would you help me? You know, don't do that. Like, but, but a lot of nursery owners are like, oh yeah, yeah, I got to do this and I got to do this and I got to do this. Now what you do is when you ask these questions, don't just come and hang around and like ask them questions at their desk. <coughs> what you do is say, oh man, these apple trees are beautiful. I'll take two of those for my yard. By the way, if I wanted to start a plant nursery, okay, you know, like buy something, even if it's just an African violet or something, be like, these are so beautiful. You did such a great job. I thought about starting a nursery. Is it hard? Like, do you have a lot of paperwork you have to do? I mean, I hope you don't mind me asking. And most, most people are like, oh, no, you know, here's what you do. Bah, 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 bah. And it was um, Dave Taylor from Taylor Gardens Nursery in uh, Spar, Florida, uh, who got me started in the nursery business. I, I went over and I volunteered at his nursery until I felt like I understood how things work. I mean, I literally went and volunteered, which is, um, I mean, I think a lot of people are doing that. Instead of going and getting a college degree, if you're smart, you find somebody that's already successful, you follow them and say, how did you do it? Can I follow you around? Can I carry your stuff? Can I help you unload your truck? I mean, you just kind of show up and see if you can help. And I was already buying plants from him. I knew him. We've been in and out of there. Um, you know, one winter I just volunteered to go over and prune all of his grapevines because he had a couple of acres of you pick and he's out there doing it all by himself. And I'm like, hey man, I'm going to come over tomorrow and just prune through a couple of these rows. And he was like, really? I was like, yeah, just show me how to do it. And so that sort of thing, you make, you make the connections and it's, and it's really easy. Um, so yeah, it depends. Ask, ask locally and get set up, but it was not nearly as hard as I, I thought. So oh, yeah, uh, Daniel says he loves the shirt, the compost your enemy shirt that is uh, available from Aardvark screen printing. Actually, if you Google compost your enemies, you will find my shirt at um, Aardvark screen printing. He's a friend of mine. He used to do his radio ads. I still do ads for him occasionally. And uh, he's like, I'll print shirts for you. So it's a good family business, and I would much rather do that than go to some big printing company. He's got a like a small screen printing company in Alabama, and they're cool people. So, hello from Australia. Yeah, now Ed, Ed asks, um, this season I'm looking to sell 2,000 lemon trees, 1,000 passion fruit, 5,000 pecan pepper, 500 strawberries, and 500 habanero plants, maybe up to 1,000 passion fruit plants. But these are all low profit. Yeah, I I, I understand. Um, you also say so at the moment I'm using 45 square meters to make around 12k annually. It feels like I've hit a ceiling. The space is all inside a poly tunnel in South Africa. I'm selling plants to nurseries. That's your problem right there. How can you increase your nurseries in the same space as a small nursery? Sell directly to the public. Do not sell to other nurseries. Now, if you're if you're wholesaling stuff, you have a guaranteed market, and that's why people get into wholesale. Plus, if you can mass produce and you've got like some of these big cloning facilities, like AgriStarts in Orlando, man alive! I mean, they they just they just crank out a million plants a year, and they sell to everybody. Everybody's selling like the same variety of mulberry and red banana and whatever because they all got it from AgriStarts. And they grow it up themselves from small from small plants. But if you can sell directly to the public, that's where the money is. Um, if you if you're producing good looking plants and you can figure out how to connect to the public, now there's a there's obviously a risk in that. You probably know more about the commercial nursery business than I do because I'm a backyard bandit. I was like shoestring, small space. I never produced near that many plants, but my profit margins on a lot of plants were really high like um, Mexican tree spinach, right? Um, I pick niche niche stuff, and there's there's a chapter in the book on finding your niche. And, and you might really like azaleas, but if every nursery is carrying azaleas, uh, you don't want to compete with that. You don't want to compete with the big um, landscaping suppliers, like if everybody is selling ficus hedges or something. Um, that's a bad deal. Don't get into that market. But uh, I've seen some cool niche nurseries. There's one woman, Petro's Pawpaws. All she sells is native Florida pawpaw trees. That's the Asamina genus. So she sells Asamina parviflora, Asamina pygmaea, Asamina triloba, 
She sells native Florida pawpaws, which specific butterflies feed on, which native plant lovers love. And they're a very small niche that nobody knows about except for her. She's a total expert on it. So anytime somebody is looking for like a totally unique small fruiting plant that's native to Florida, she's cornered the market. And what does it cost her? She's got trees all over her yard. She buys pots, she puts soil in the pots, she plants the seeds in the pots, and about a year later she makes 16, 20 bucks a plant. Nobody else has that market. And so, you know, don't go take her market, go find your own. But um, I actually didn't sell pawpaws, uh, the native Florida pawpaws. The only one I sold was Asamina triloba, which grew up north as well as in Florida because she was a friend of mine and I didn't want to compete with her. But my niche was food forest plants, perennial vegetables and fruit trees and stuff that was just like really weird and cool, like witch hazel. You know, who's selling witch hazel? I mean, you only see it in bottles. That was like the only person selling witch hazel. I would find stuff that just right, we were just right in our climate, it would work. Or stuff that we were kind of zone pushing a little bit, like I sold coffee. I told people how to grow coffee. And, uh, you know, hardly anybody's selling coffee in Florida. That was like, it's cool. People are like, I can grow a coffee plant. I said, yes, don't let it freeze. Bring it into the pot as a house plant during the winter and you've got it. And so I had a coffee bush that I bought for 30 bucks from a rare plant nursery. And I grew it up until it had berries, you know, little coffee cherries on it. And I would split those little seeds out and I would plant them in the spring. And then I would sell them like a few months later when they were like this tall for like six bucks each. And that was a, that was, you know, a good deal because nobody could get coffee. I probably could ask 10 for them and still sold them. But I, I don't want to be too greedy, though you, you can be when you're the only person that has the market. Um, but people said, hey, do you ever, you know, drink the coffee? Do you ever make your own coffee off of the coffee that you're growing? I'm like, no. No, because it's like $300 a cup. I mean, a cup of those beans, if I planted them, I'd make a bunch of little plants way more. I'll go buy my coffee. I'll go buy a pot of Folgers, you know, one of those things because uh, it was way too valuable. I, it was a little niche. And so I got to kind of feed my plant habit. So, uh, yes, the book, let me see if I can find, somebody asked about the link. Uh, I will put the link in the chat. I was setting, I was setting this thing up to run and I had it all beautiful with all the links and everything. There we go. Easy way to start a home-based plant nursery. I just dropped it into the chat. Um, so yeah, everybody asks what country I'm in. Um, I'll, I'll talk on that another time. Um, we will be starting a plant nursery here too, though. Uh, so I am going to read some of the, the comments here. Yeah. Offloading on the nurseries is fast and easy, Ed writes, but I'm going to try selling directly. It, here's, here's what I recommend, Ed. Pick something that people aren't growing or pick like a few things that people aren't growing. I would not stop with your, your regular production. You already have a successful nursery. You're already making money. You're, you've hit a ceiling. I wouldn't drop it and change it because a guy on YouTube who had success in Florida um, did that. But what I would do is find a few cool niche things. I mean, do you have like a local tree that makes edible fruit or a flower that grows nowhere else in the world? Something that can instill a little bit of local pride, you know, where people are like excited, could get excited about it. Or something that nobody has in the whole area. Maybe it's something from Southeast Asia, you know, like I grew Mexican tree spinach, which is a fantastic green, super easy to grow. It makes a perennial tree if you let it get big. It's like a spinach tree. And um, I was one of the few people that had it for sale. And I just kept bringing it out. And all I had to do was take cuttings, stick them in pots, and wait about four or five months for them to root up nicely and start putting on some good leaves. And then I'm selling for six bucks a pot. And uh, I made, you know, my profit margin was fantastic. It was what, like 600% profit after I paid for the dirt and the, you know, the water and the, the pot probably. So uh, I would pick a few niche things and then hit them hard and, and, and advertise and talk to people and try to find a place where, where people, um, you know, people can see you and you can actually connect with the, uh, connect with the public. Let me see what, what we have here. Yes, marijuana and tobacco are always a profit gain. As a matter of fact, um, mar marijuana is one I don't I don't mess with. People always accuse me of smoking pot because I have these dopey eyes and I say a lot of uh, stupid stuff. But I don't. 
I don't. I do like tobacco though, and tobacco is actually something that you could you could definitely sell uh, the plant at least. If you started them up and sold them, like nobody is selling them. everybody. It's sort of like this big commodity crop that these massive farms grow. And if you had potted tobacco, people would be like, no way, that's tobacco. You would sell them all day long. I guarantee it. So yes, hemp is lucrative and legal. Non addictive, natural, with no side effects. Yes, I'm glad that that hemp got passed, but. But I think that I, I would be a little concerned. You can correct me if I'm not here. I, I would not be real quick to grow hemp because don't you think you might have problems with authorities kind of grading your property? Maybe. What are you growing? It depends. Yeah. yeah. I don't ever trust, you know, the, the, the federal government gives and the federal government takes away. Um, but. Yeah, I I don't I don't like it because it's uh, in part because I um, I mean I don't like the drug aspect of marijuana, but but the what I don't like about the market right now for the hemp and marijuana thing, you see all these companies, all they have to do is add cannabis to the name of a company, and the stock goes through the roof. I like to follow the stock market and see what's going on, and so so there's this huge crazy boom where everybody thinks they're going to get rich, and you may get rich. You may hit the right thing and be the guy that does it, but chances are the big players and stuff are going to play the market. People are planting massive amounts of it. The market will go up and crash and go up and crash because it's all hot right now. So it's really hard to say um, where it would go. But you know, if you if you think you've got a niche opportunity, go for it because I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't discourage anybody from trying to seek a profitable uh, niche so long as it's not dangerous or illegal. You know? So, did you have anything you wanted to add in? I don't know. All right. My my uh, realm of expertise is very small. So yeah, she's she's my uh, she's my encourager and my muse. And a lot of people have said, Rachel, you've got to write a cookbook. And Rachel was planning on writing a cookbook. It's just we keep having like a baby every year or two. And, and moving, it seems. Like and moving every year or two. And, so. And have children. So I know yeah. It's a lot of time. Yeah, it's funny. So the, the book got started, and it's kind of. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. We've got uh, got a few more questions here. Pigmaster. Yes. Hi. Get a shout out. Have a have a good night. Um, had an agave tequiliana growing in our yard in Florida when we moved into our home and went to full maturity and seeded with pups. Sold the pups at a garage sale at three for five bucks. That's good. I actually had a lot of trouble trying to sell agave. There was a glut in the North Florida market for agave plants. There were the variegated ones and the blue agave, and I tried to tell, sell them as grow your own tequila, and I couldn't do it. People were like, those are just those things that are everywhere. There was just too many. Um, there was just too many. Uh, yes, we use tobacco as an insecticide, Tim. Um, I've got a video on it. Uh, let's see. What's a great but cheap cover crop oh man um, go to the bulk bins at the whole foods market or the grocery or whatever and get yourself some buckwheat get some southern peas get some dry lentils i would i took all these different seeds like every kind of seed that they had just about i soaked them in water and i threw them all over the ground what i tried to do was get a mixture of grains and a mixture of um nitrogen fixers and during the summer, what I would do is I would take the southern peas and I would plant those because they could take the heat right through the summer when everything else was dying. I would throw southern peas all over the place and just like rake them into the ground and keep them watered and let the whole ground get covered with southern peas, till them under before I did the, the fall. But in the in the fall, I would plant buckwheat, which will which will bloom and grow like crazy all the way until frost, and then it freezes down. And I would also plant um, wheat and rye and lentils and chickpeas which could take cold and dry peas if I could get them and any any of the bean mixes from the store usually you can soak them and rake them into the ground and, and they're a good cover crop that is way 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 cheap very easy to do uh, mustard is a good cover crop too if you get bulk mustard seed and throw it around because mustard is a nematode repellent so you can throw it in there so uh, Paul asks, slightly unrelated to the subject of your channel, but David, do you have an opinion on the solar minimum cycle and the reported coming ice age? Yes, I believe in a coming ice age. I believe that for a few years, but I, I try to keep a mouth shut because I don't want to get in big fights with people over climate change. I believe the climate changes, um, and, but I'm on the ice age end of the thing. I think it's 
it would actually only take one volcano to throw us into a nasty year without a summer. From my reading of history, there have been multiple events like that, and we also have a low sunspot cycle. So, but I'm I'm no scientific expert. But there's a reason I'm in the tropics. <laughs> mustard is delicious. Mustard, we had oh a year yeah. There that <clears throat> I planted mustard, and I think it all came up. It's fantastic. It was a great. It's great. It's a great year. That sounds like the mustard. Oh yeah, mustard is good. It's good to cook. Uh, it's it's great to it's it's a great cooked green. I think it's um we like it better than collards, and I like collards. Yeah, tindura and passion fruit vine uh, candle rites are easy to root in Florida. The only problem is is that uh, tindura is on the invasive species list, so you have to be careful. Um, there's a lot of plants that are really cool, like yams. Everybody asks me, can I get some yams? Can I get some yams? Like the best yams were on the invasive species list, so I couldn't grow them in my nursery legally. They would have shut me down, and who knows what else. Um, so, Tindora is for those who wonder. That's Coccinia grandis, which is a perennial cucumber from India. Uh, salt proof rights. Uh, I have been doing some raised beds, but I don't like how permanent they seem. Yeah, I, I like just mounded soil. I mean, I, I don't like to. I don't like to build all the beds. I like to change my gardens around all the time. Yeah, it seems like every time we do annual beds, like every new season, we put them in. We do something completely different. Kind yeah. Of, yeah. It's we switch around. I mean, a lot of the beds kind of end up somewhat permanent. Um, yeah. You know, when we when we get a nice loose bed, we just keep walking around it, and weeding around it, and they go for years. I just like to mound them up, kind of John Jeevan style. Four foot by however long, and loosen them with a broad fork. Take the rocks out and stuff. Throw in some seaweed. Throw in some compost. Throw in whatever I have. Uh, we've got Claremont. Hello from Claremont. Um, tips for curing sweet potatoes. How do we cure sweet potatoes? Remember how we did it? We just pull them out of the ground and Put let them. In a big cardboard box. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Right, we just basically, we, you, you take them out of the ground, you try not to bruise them and beat yeah. them up, be careful. We didn't wash them. Don't wash we them don't first, wash them. yeah, we didn't bother washing them. Now, I've heard some people wash them first and then dry them, but we didn't wash them first because I felt like we didn't want to tear the skins up at all. Right. So we, we wanted them to keep it as long as possible. We spread them on the back porch in the shade for a few That's days true. to dry out. We did do that. Kinda, and then put them in a cardboard box and stick them in the pantry, and they would keep for months. Uh, often they would start sprouting in the box and we would be able to plant some the next the next spring, but they, they kept a lot, lot longer than I thought. And sweet potatoes, when you first pull them out of the ground, are not very sweet. Right. They're very disappointing. It's like if you harvest pumpkins early, it's it's not that great. So, so how long do you, need, do, do you wait? This is something that I remember. You can't just say. Oh, uh, yeah, just wait They're some unspecified period first, of time by so my book. Next question. No. Well, is it in your book? Is it what you say? Yeah, sweet potatoes okay, aren't so which sweet. Book? Probably. <laughs> I just don't even know anymore. <laughs> I have written about it before. You have to buy all the books. Yeah, you have to buy all the books to find out about sweet potatoes. Or you can just Google it. No, it's um, basically it's like a week or so. A week or two is good enough. With, with pumpkins, like seminal pumpkins, uh, cucurbita machata, it's more like you wait um, you wait a couple of months and they right. come in really well. At least six weeks. You know, if you harvest your pumpkin, you're like, yeah, I've got a pumpkin. I'm going to bring it inside. It's like, this is so bland. This is so boring. We should have just carved a jack-o'-lantern out of it. Uh, Nirvana never dies asks Mormon Mennonite Christian do you have religious beliefs yes I believe in Jesus Christ the Son of God uh, the one and only way to heaven and um, I, I am closest to a Calvinist Presbyterian that would be about where we fall we're, we're grim five-point predestination Calvinists uh, but we currently go to a Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Church, which is which is a nice church. Um, <clears throat> do I like the ideas of portable air pruning beds? I haven't looked into it. I have seen some cool stuff, um, some cool pots that have been done. Um, let's see. Hello from Ocala. Hey, they're old uh, stomping grounds here. Oh yeah, where do you get the, the, the compost your enemy t-shirts? Just a second. I will give you the link. <laughs> it's so funny, that shirt. My mom's always like, that is just kind of mean. I'm like, I know, but it sells well. And she's like, is that where you get your morality? <laughs> Sorry, mom. I, I, like I like the shirt. It's not, it's not, it's not completely literal. Okay, so 
Hello from South Florida. Oh, yes. Hello. So they said collards. It's always another. Collards are, are fantastic. Yeah, and they're very, very healthy for you. Yes. Um, <laughs> I happen to be wearing my 100% vegan compost shirt. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, please consider producing a music video. I've thought about it, but it's it's so much time. Oh my goodness, it's hard. Yes, you can get cool varieties of yams at the Oriental markets. Um, the Name yam is usually the big one. That's usually either Dioscoria cayenensis or Dioscoria alata, both of which are are very good, productive yams. Um, you can also get the Chinese yam, which they keep changing the name on it. I think it's Dioscoria batatas. Um, <clears throat> Got your winter garden growing in Miami. Yeah, that's this is the time. Kimberly says, I'm diligently looking for a place to live like you guys. Man, we had to, it was a long time. We've gone from place to place to place, saved our money, lived on next to nothing. Um, I mean, I could talk a whole hour on budgeting with a large family. It's amazing. Like, I, I made so little money for so many years, and I still don't make very much money. I mean, I'm a writer, so... <laughs> and I, I was like, I don't, it's like people are like, get a Patreon or something. It's like I have a Patreon somewhere, but I never, I don't even know what to do with it. I don't, I don't really do that sort of thing. If you like it, you know, buy, buy, buy a book, buy a T-shirt or whatever. Send me a super chat. I think we can do that, can we? Um, send me like tons of money on super chat. <sighs> okay, uh, flowers are the most expensive crops on our farmers market. Yeah, hey, you know, Michael, if uh, people are selling flowers and they're making money on it, great. I. I don't like actually having to deal with all the handling. I didn't grow and sell lettuces either. It's like, I don't know, take yeah, care of Yeah, the most expensive, but how are they selling? Are people buying them? If they're priced you know, yeah, expensively, if you, but people aren't buying them. I would probably, eat, eat if I was going to grow flowers, I would probably bypass the farmer's market altogether and go directly to flower arrangers and wedding, wedding mm -hmm. arrangers, that sort of thing. I would grow a beautiful set of stuff in the yard, I would make some phone calls, I would invite some people over, I would bring in some samples, and I would just sell directly and be like... And look into or think about selling them as organic. Yeah, you, know, you can do that too, right? You can smell Particularly the if you're selling organic. But that's hard though with flowers. I mean, yeah, those, look at those roses. Oh yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, the only thing we grow are like... <laughs> Pogan Bia. I'm just thinking if you, if you stack I'm just thinking, okay, I'm just thinking organic wedding bouquet, big yeah. bucks, you know, people, oh, that's organic. You can really. So, um, we got, uh, how did the guanacaste tree do? That's, that's enterolobium. It's actually, I thought it was enterolobium cyclocarpum, but it was actually enterolobium corticicuum. Um, how did it grow in North Florida? I didn't get a chance to get them to grow as big as I like. They were small when I left. However, uh, my friend Craig Hepworth is in Citra, and he's a brilliant plant guy. Um, he's a friend of Eric Tonesmeyer, so I, I know somebody that knows Eric Tonesmeyer directly. Um, but he was growing them, and they would freeze back a bit and then grow again, so they were like self, they, they would go up, and then they would freeze down partly, and then they would grow higher, and they would freeze down partly. He had these great big huge ones, and they were super green, and they were growing through his food forest project. So it will grow in North Florida. I would plant them in the spring, get them established a little bit before they go. So, yes, the hundred percent vegan compost shirt is still available. If you go to the, um, uh, the Aardvark screen printing site, let me see. I'll put the. He's got some cool. He does some cool shirts for me, um, and and he doesn't mind my bizarre sense of humor. He's got good artists and stuff, so. Korean sweet potatoes, yeah. Are they the are they the purple ones? I grew some purple ones that I think were Korean sweet potatoes, but they might have been Japanese. All all of your gardens have been frozen since October. I'm so sorry. Um, at least it gives you a break to look through seed catalogs. Zone seven fruit trees, yes. Apples, pears. Um, you can grow both sweet cherries and sour cherries. I really like the um, the sour cherry hedges. Goodness, somebody, somebody fill in the name on that one. What were those things called? They had a funny name. Um, there's a short cherry cherry hedge, uh, but there's quite a few varieties of apples you can grow there. You can grow peaches. Uh, Alberta peach is a really good one. Um, there are plums. We had some beautiful plums. You can also grow chestnuts and 
pecans. Pecans actually grow further north than a lot of people think. You can grow walnuts. Black walnuts are really easy to grow, um, but they're, they're not as good a walnut, but they're actually awesome for for the, the wood of them and to use as a dye. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of really good fruit trees you can grow, and that's just kind of scratching the surface on it. Almonds. Almonds are probably a little touchy. You're, you may be at the top. You may be, maybe um, the hardy almond might do it. Yes, you can, put marine, you can put moringa in a greenhouse. You can also grow it as an annual. Uh, are we doing air layering? I have done air layering, but I don't do it very often. Six-year-old, is that Lily? Wants you to know she got a pumpkin growing kit for Christmas, and now she has six-inch sprouts. Well, good work! Aww, good work, that's great. It's a good way to start. I got started uh, when I was six years old, actually. It sprouted a bean in a cup, as you can see in my YouTube trailer, which I have to update at some point. Um, California Backyard Orchard. Yeah, my wife and I want to start carrying plants in our shop, and are currently looking at the permits to import some Hoyas from Thailand to start. Do you have any experience with importing or advice? Yeah, you got to be careful. Um, I, I, I actually quit selling through the mail because there were so many restrictions, but on the importing side of things, I would probably talk to some other nursery owners who were buying in. I didn't buy anything in from overseas because it looked like it was kind of a pain in the neck. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a better uh, answer for you on that. Yeah, uh, with a moringa, you definitely got to have a you got to have a greenhouse probably past zone nine. We were in zone nine slash eight. We're like right on the edge, and they would freeze the ground. But I would mound up stuff over the top of them. Um, but you can grow them up to ten feet as an annual if you can manage to get seeds somewhere. It's just uh, you'll lose the you'll lose the trees that you planted. They come. Yeah, I'd like to get my brother. I try to get my brother to start a YouTube channel because he's he's really funny and he's he's sort of like me, but but better built and um, he's not really such a plant guy. He's a firefighter paramedic hero, like a total hero, saving lives, climbing into burning buildings and all that stuff. And he works out at the gym all the time. He's got a great wife and kids, um, but but he's hard to, he's like, yeah, I don't really think I got time to do YouTube. It's like, yeah, that's because you're, you've got like five jobs. And he's kind of saving people's lives every day. Yeah, he's like saving people's it's lives and stuff. I don't have time to stream. I'm in the, you know, I'm in the fire truck. So, I may build a hugo culture garden. I, I, okay. I like the concept. I think it may be a little bit overrated. Um, I think it's a good concept. I, I've actually done it by in container gardens. Like I dump a bunch of wood and debris into the bottom of container gardens. The, but the big thing I don't like about hugo culture garden is the actual lead is like digging the trench and digging all that soil. It's just murder in the heavy clay with rocks. And so... We like the concept more when we had one sand and yeah. an improvement and, and two no rocks because we had sand and it... Yeah, yeah. Dig. So now we have clay and rocks. Yeah, so I, I tend to I tend to just make boring, you know, mound, like regular, just slightly mounded gardens, and I will compost that material in a big pile, or I'll pile it up in my food forest and let it rot and feed the ground, because uh, it's it's constantly turning in humus and it feeds the fungi, so, you know, um, I, I don't have anything against it, it's just way too much work. If I had a bobcat, or my neighbor had a bobcat, and could just like tear a little hole, push a bunch of logs in and do it, I mean, I don't even have a chainsaw, so it's, it's, it's just... I've never had all the materials all at once in the inclination, um, but I, I like the concept. Moringa work in zone seven if you cut them back with heavy mulch. Possibly. I would I would very heavily mulch them like a few feet. They might live. The problem is, is uh, in rainy conditions, when it's cool or cold, they will often just rot. They have serious rot issues. Like I had them um, get covered and the whole inside rot out because I had a rainy summer so you or rainy winter so you may have to actually cover it with a mulch and then put a tarp over it to make sure it doesn't soak underneath it just keeps a little bit of moisture so it stays alive but it, it doesn't it's not going to grow at all all the way through the cold season probably below 75 degrees if it doesn't grow growing banana trees in central florida haven't produced yet only a year old yeah i wrote a couple of articles on uh, banana trees on the website and growing them in north florida 
Um, the big thing with bananas, water. They're like 100 inches of water a year. The second big thing is tons of nitrogen. They're like a total nitrogen pig. The best ones I ever saw had both water and tons of nitrogen because they were growing next to a broken septic tank. So, uh, yeah, they will grow, but if you want them to grow fast, you've got to, like, feed them like they're, they're pigs. So. Google is awesome in the desert because it retains moisture and provides organic material. Yeah, the only thing I worry about with, with in the desert is that um, having a mound like this means you're higher above the water table, and I would think it would um, possibly be very hard to get it wet enough to begin with that it'll actually stay wet all the way through. I don't, I don't know because I haven't tried it in the desert, but I think if I was going to do it, I would probably trench it and have a very low mound rather than the high, the high mound, so it doesn't dry the. <coughs> <laughs> Dang, that lady is very pretty. Yeah, it's good. Did you make that up? Is that me? No, you don't even see it. Yeah. <laughs> make a banana circle. Yeah, banana circle's great. Um, I've got pictures of my old, old banana circle. So, basically, we'll get back to the nursery. Uh, I started a nursery, and I was profitable in just a few months. The list of stuff I had to buy was pretty minimal. Got some ground cover cloth. I got pots, I begged, borrowed, begged and borrowed pots. I didn't actually steal any, I begged and borrowed some. And uh, a friend of mine had a nursery project he just didn't have time for, he gave me a bunch of pots. And I got um, other pots later I, I bought. I had a, a local yard that sold mulch and gravel and that sort of thing, dumped some loads of topsoil. I paid my 25 bucks for the license. Um, I paid to go to the farmer's market, like 10 or 20 bucks a week, depending on the market. I actually ran two markets at one point. I had a big battered, um, ugly, rusty 2001 Dodge van with a huge engine in it, uh, Dodge 2500 Ram. And I could take the seats out of it and stuff the car with plants. And that was enough to do um, the farmer's markets. And then I had a little wire trailer I paid like 450 bucks for so I could do the big plant shows. Big plant shows are good money because everybody there wants to buy plants. Whereas the farmer's market, some people are there just to hang out. Some people want to go buy some ice cream or some meat or whatever else. They may or may not be interested in plants. But when you go to a plant show, if you can stand out and really like talk to everybody that comes by, those people are just itching to part with their money and go home with plants. So it's, it's you know. It's and it's kind of fun to, uh, well, for many years, you know, David's been working from home. So suddenly he had the plant nursery. So, okay. We're on a time schedule, which we almost never had time schedules before. So, okay, the market starts at this time. We're gonna load up the um, trailer. We gotta get out there, and what are we gonna make? We don't know what we're gonna make, so we do our very best, and, and we would go and, and pick up plants that um, other people were selling, and and, and we sell them, and, and it was a it's a lot of fun to what can we make? What can we possibly make? Yeah, yeah. All right, NK, you're gone. Um, so, yes, clumping bamboo. You know what? Every time you mention bamboo, people freak out, and you have to always explain, no, it's clumping bamboo. It's clumping bamboo. There is a market for bamboo, but um, the average person is like they freak out because they know they had this neighbor and like next to their mom, and the bamboo like came through the floor and it punched a hole through the bed at night and killed someone because it was growing so fast and it grows like 10 feet a day and it made like this thicket and then they had to call the police. You know, <laughs> so it's like, like everybody has this horrible running bamboo story. I actually planted bamboo in my yard. It was supposed to be like bamboo's nigra. It was supposed to be the black bamboo, which yeah. is this really pretty bamboo. So I planted this little tuft of bamboo and it was like, oh, it's so cute. And like a couple years later, it grew, and it's like, it took a little while to get going, but after about two years, suddenly a shoot comes up like three feet away, and I'm like, oh, that's weird. I thought yeah. this was a clumper. Yeah. And then the next year, there were shoots like eight feet away in all directions, and then the next year, there were like 15 feet away, and I was like, oh, shoot, I better sell the house. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so yeah, uh, Oh, Dan Stephanie, nice to see you guys. Um, you went to each of your Jacksonville, got chai, longevity spinach, and a couple of mulberries. Those were all good sellers for me. Hardly anybody had them. Hardly anybody didn't, you know, knew about them. And um, I, I think that I single-handedly popularized mulberries in Florida again. 
um, because I wrote an article for Natural Awakenings magazine, and and I wrote about this awesome mulberry tree that I planted in my yard. I'd gotten a mulberry tree. I didn't know much about mulberries, except that when Rachel and I were kids, she told me, um, we were kids, right? I was 10, she was eight. We knew each other because our, our her her parents were starting to homeschool, and my mom was a homeschool mom. I was homeschooled, and um, so her mom said, oh, you know how to homeschool. Uh, could you tell me how you, know, how you do this and that and the other thing? Somebody had recommended my mom to her, so we ended up kind of hanging out together me and my brother and Rachel and her younger brother. And Rachel says, there's a tree down the road that makes blackberries. Like you could just eat them off the tree. And I was like, really? <laughs> like we knew blackberries from when we went to the mountains of North Carolina, but I didn't know a tree made blackberries. I and mean, that's crazy. So um, she and her brother and me and my brother, we went down the road and we picked mulberries off the street. So I love this tree, but I'd never grown it before, and I kind of have forgotten about it. And I, I later rediscovered it. I was like, oh, that's the blackberry tree. So I got a couple of trees to try in my yard um, before I even started my nursery. And um, and they were great. And so I started a few cuttings, and then I ended up um, having a couple in the nursery. But I, I, had to, I had a regular column that I wrote for Natural Awakenings magazine, just a gardening advice column. And... I, I was so psyched about this tree. I had tried to grow strawberries. I tried to grow blackberries. I'd grown raspberries. And I had like limited success with all of them. I did so okay with some blackberries. We got some tropical raspberries that worked. Some other ones that made a couple. Strawberries were a pain in the neck. And then this tree, this mulberry tree, makes sweet berries. And we got like six gallons off of it when it was two years old. And I went, Whoa, organic berries, you know, six gallons. So I wrote this like glowing article about mulberry trees. And I forgot all about it because it's like a month and a half or a month ahead of publication or something. I have my little plant nursery. At the bottom of the article, it says, you know, David the Good has this, you know, has his plants for sale at the 326 market uh, on Thursday afternoons. And so like a month, a month and a half later, this woman shows up. She goes, do you have any mulberry trees for sale? I said, uh, I might have one. I said, I said, nobody ever, nobody ever actually, you know, buys, buys them that often. You know, he's like, I, I, I think I have one. I said, it's a great tree. I said, where'd you hear about mulberries? She goes, oh, I read it in this article. I said, did you know, I wrote that article. She goes, oh, you wrote it. She didn't even know. She didn't even, she just happened to incidentally have read the article. And then there were like more people asking for more mulberries and more and more and more. And I had only propagated a few. I had forgotten all about the article. I just like wrote this glowing article about mulberries. And I had never connected like what I had written with what I could sell. I was like, oh my goodness. Like I don't have enough mulberries. I have like 10. And, um, you know, so I started like propagating as fast as I could. But there's like a four or five, six month lag between the time I've got a little branch going till the time it was like this big and I could sell it in a pot. And those were still small trees. But I sold every mulberry that I could sell. And um, and other people were like, oh, I want to buy that tree that makes the berries. I want to get the tree that makes the berries. And um, and then, uh, like a couple other nurseries, um, somebody said, you know, somebody, they were telling me, David, you know, somebody came in here looking for mulberry trees the other day. And all we have are the, the type that don't fruit. Like, we've got the ornamental. And I'm like, a mulberry that doesn't fruit, that's like an abomination. You know, but and he's like, do you have any mulberries? I'm, like, I'm working on it. And then people, like, people started selling mulberries. And I think it was just because this article, it was like people didn't realize there's this cool niche crop. And within two years, uh, I think it was Agristart started selling a dwarf mulberry variety. Now you can see dwarf mulberry for sale all over Florida. But before I wrote that article and people started going and then they started reading my website or whatever, I think it kind of word of mouth because after the first year, they're bearing. I mean, they bear really fast. So everybody's like, oh my goodness, you have to try this fruit. And so once a few people have them and they start sharing it, suddenly it's just everywhere so you know th things go through fads that way so um but i i like to think that it, maybe it was me I, I love those things <clears throat> i don't know if i have super chat set up thank you for trying um i'm, I'm supposed to but um i don't know <laughs> thank you for trying um I'm just being honest. Rachel is a gorgeous young lady. Well, Dave is in love with berries. Well, I love Rachel too. Uh, you're not trying to be honest. You're a covert, nasty, terrible person. Okay. Goodbye. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. Anything nice to say? Uh, unless you're talking about somebody else, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, I like your channel. I like nice to see a channel that caters to tropical gardening fruits and provisions. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. So anyhow, um, you have some rare ever-bearing mulberry. Yeah, those are very good. Uh, pomegranate trees are also easy to start from cutting, so it's easy. So. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, this is fun. I can just like ditch people. So. All right. Got it. Got it. Okay, I'll put you back in. Beta, we'll see. I can put. I can unhide. Come on, look at that. Well, this is fun. Anyhow, um, how did I get started in gardening? I got started in gardening um, because I actually, I actually, it's funny because I'm, I'm homeschooled. My parents really encouraged me in gardening, but I actually was introduced to gardening when I was in a little private Christian school. My dad was a uh, English teacher in a school, and so we got in like for a discount rate or something like that. So I went to kindergarten, and this teacher did this little demonstration where she brought in Dixie cups with a little bit of soil in them and gave us all beans. And so we planted um, the beans, and then like five days later when they started coming up, I was just like, oh, it's like magic. So I went and I raided my mom's pantry, and I dug into all the dry beans and everything, and I just started planting them in little pots of sand all around the backyard and everywhere I could do it. And I was just, I was completely hooked. And I, I told my dad, Dad, I want a garden. And Dad's like, Dad wasn't a gardener. He was a landscape guy. He had his landscape was set, and he had his perfect St. Augustine grass, and that was good. And he didn't know the name of any plants, really, or anything. But he's like, oh, I guess I can get you a garden. So he went and he, he got some uh, railroad ties, eight-foot railroad ties. And he cut this eight-foot by eight-foot patch in the backyard. And um, I bought a few packets of seeds. My dad dumped some soil back there. I used my allowance and bought a little bit of seeds here and there. Every time we would go, like if they were going out to Home Depot, I'd be like, can I go buy some seeds? And so that's when I got started. I actually still have the book. Um, Florida Gardening by Stan DeFridis, uh, my parents said, wrote, To Our Little Green Thumb, uh, and that was my eighth or ninth birthday, and I still have the book with a little dedication in the front, so um, my parents got me started, but it was growing a bean in a cup, so if, if you get a kid going at the beginning, it's, you know, they'll just go. What fruit trees can you graft on a grape myrtle? Danny, you know better than that. <laughs> Grass grows green or over the septic tank? Yes. Hey, Daniel, how are you doing? Um... Is there a way to stop eucalyptus from turning the soil hydrophobic? Probably not. I mean, probably even if you deep mulched it, uh, it would still suck the moisture out. They're, they're pretty awesome. Um, planting in a septic field, yes or no? Depends on what you put down the septic tank. Uh, if you dump a bunch of chemicals down the toilet and that sort of thing, it probably wouldn't. If it's just good organic material. What did you put on what you're planting? <laughs> yeah, to plant? I, mean, I don't true. think I want to plant sweet potatoes. <laughs> And I don't think I would plant anything with big invasive roots, but um, I used to have our muscadine grapes planted over the drain field, and that was no problem. It didn't cause any trouble. Um, hello from Melbourne. Hi, nice to see you. Somebody asked if we're coming back to Florida. No, probably not. Not unless Florida becomes its own country some point in the future, and um, they want me to become the Minister <laughs> of Agriculture. How did I knew that was coming? <laughs> uh, let's see. How would you compare the Steve Solomon fertilization method as compared to the no dig method? I like Steve Solomon. I'm friends with Steve Solomon. I actually talk to him regularly online. Um, we're friends. Uh, I had such great success with his complete organic fertilizer method and with just basically using a dirt mulch thing that um, I use. I use the no dig stuff for perennials, uh, fruit trees, chop and drop, lots of mulch, that sort of thing. But my annual gardens, I, I use more of a Steve. Uh, Steve Solomon thing. Okay. Bye. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. I love your channel. I've learned so much from you. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, just, I, I, you know, I make a lot of mistakes, but uh, that's how you get better. You know, figure out what grows and what doesn't. You test stuff all the time and you just keep going. And I, I don't intend on ever, ever stopping. And I enjoy taking people along with me and saying, okay, this is what I did. And this is what I did. And, you know, this is what I did. Daniel, no, um, this is only my second live stream. I'm I'm not really great at this, so. David and the Magic Beans, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Landscaping is gardening if you're addicted to plants. Yes, it can be. 
I mean, they're plant lovers, so. Uh, gardening science. <laughs> what do y'all do with the kids when, when you both are filming? <laughs> in, in the closet back there. <laughs> are blueberries supposed to be flowering this time of year? No. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, unless you're in Australia. <clears throat> Chickens or goats? That's a good question. Man, I wrote an article on why chickens don't make sense. Um, and it's like one of those really controversial things because there's all these great uses for chickens and stuff. But but unless you hit the proper method of keeping them and you really hit a rhythm and you have a, the, a proper amount and all that sort of thing, chickens for a lot of people are a very precious but expensive hobby. Um, I can get farm eggs here, you know, like farm grown eggs for like $4.00. A dozen so there's there's other uses for chickens I love them for composting uh, material and I like the manure for the gardens and all that sort of stuff it's just um, it's just a little bit they're they're tricky there's a lot of things that want to eat chicken everything wants to eat chicken we've had dogs yeah. go after chickens we've had um, snakes eat the eggs and go after the chicks yeah. we have had possums owls things we never hawks, even saw raccoons Didn't, I mean yeah, we wake up rats. In the and rats. Yeah, we have rats come and kill all the chicks rats. the last time that we had them. So it's like, oh man, this is really, it's heartbreaking and it's difficult. So if I did yeah. it again, I would probably do a straight up coop with a very heavily fenced run that is under complete control because uh, I've just had way too many problems with things getting killed. So, What do you recommend for a privacy hedge? Um, tell me where you're located and I can make a recommendation. Uh, it's, it's too broad a question. How long do we take a lemon to fruit from seed? Actually, I just recorded a big presentation on that for the Grow Network. It's actually not gonna air um, for a couple of months, but I just did 21 trees and how to grow them from seed. And I give the period of time. So I actually have it right on top of my head, three to six years for lemons. It's also three to six years for limes and calamondins and probably kumquats, uh, oranges and grapefruits take more like six to 10 years. Uh, unless you graft them and then you can get fruit like in a year or two. <clears throat> And if you just wanted to see how long it would take, you could just sort of graft right. Yeah, yeah, you can you can graft whatever you want. Yeah, uh, chickens uh, fly over pilgrim rights. Nice to see her. Uh, we had to harvest a mean rooster today. Yeah, I had to do that. I told this one hen if she didn't stop trying to kill the other hens, I would eat her, and uh, she didn't pay any attention, so I ate her make really good soup roosters too by the way can a dog effectively ward off predators yes if you have a if you have a good dog you're a dog person you put a dog outside but but you also have to take care of a dog and dogs are also very destructive in the gardens and you have so. to make sure your dog doesn't like the chickens yeah there is that too but a, but a well-trained dog yes that's yeah, that's a great it's yeah. great so if you know how to dog. <laughs> Did I ever grow a ground apple I'm not sure what that is oh. Ever thought about doing any YouTube collaborations? I think you could get in the over 1 million range. Yeah, I don't think I've ever done that. Watching deer meat for dinner seems like you might be down to trying your techniques. Yeah, that would be fun. I'd be happy to do that. I, I try to plug other um, people regularly in my books, more so in my books than on YouTube, because I actually don't watch a lot of videos. Um, so... Uh, we have talked about how fun it would be. Hey, what if so-and-so came and you guys could do a thing together? Yeah. That would be fun. Yeah, you just tried buying the ebook and your iPad won't read. Did you buy it from the Gumroad link or did you buy it from Amazon? Um, just drop me an email, david at floridafoodforests.com. David at floridafoodforests.com, Thomas, and um, I'll make sure that you get a format that works. Uh, it's a Kindle format, it's Amazon. Privacy screen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you can get a hedge that's edible at the same time, uh, country frow, yes, do that. Uh, get something edible. Wandering Jew is a very good ground cover. Uh, it, it takes a lot of abuse. It will basically just grow on its own, hold the ground together, and it'll keep the ground cool. It's good for underneath trees, too. Go in the shade. Gregory, yes, thank you. Um, 
Gregory says, just read your starting a nursery book, inspiring. Any additional thoughts? Yeah, uh, you don't know if it's going to succeed until you try it. Um, I was I was scared to start that kind of a business for a long time because I was afraid of this and that and the other thing and blah, 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 blah. And I thought about it off and on for years. I always loved plants. As a matter of fact, there's a picture in my, my book of me at like age 11 with a table full of plants in my parents' front yard. I put it at the beginning of the book. And... Um, but then I found out there's this thing called the government and it's kind of scary and I was doing other stuff and I was trying to write and I, I, I did a lot of radio work. I did some voice acting and that kind of thing. And so I just, I just never quite did it until finally I got a push into it. And I was like, why did I never do this? And now that I'm not even in Florida, I might as well just give you guys all the secrets because it's, um, it was, uh, it's funny. I woke up on a Saturday morning and I thought, I really should just write down what I did and how I made that nursery successful. I bet you people would appreciate that. And I'll, I'll, I'll ask more money for it than I do for my normal books. I'll ask 10 bucks because I think 10 bucks, you'll get that back with one plant sale. So I, I just decided to, to try that because, um, you know, I've got to build a house, so I've got to figure out how to make a little extra money. And, uh, and I think that, um, it's so, it was so valuable to me to have the mentorship of, of uh, Dave and Gouda Taylor, even though I was doing a completely different thing than them. And I'm actually a much better marketer. I'm actually, a, I ended up a much better marketer than most things. And it's a, matter, it's, it's a matter of loving the plants and talking about the plants and engaging with everybody like their your friend, everybody that comes by who is interested in plants as a fellow gardener. So talk to them about plants. If they buy your plants, great. If they don't buy your plants, great. It doesn't matter. Um, I mean, people, people would come by and they didn't have money to buy plants. I'd sometimes give them cuttings. And, and people remember that. They're like, you love plants, I love plants. And they, they see something they haven't seen before, and you have it, and they want to bless you. They're just like, I want to buy that from you, and I want to buy that. And, and you know what? Sell me that, too. Uh, because they see that you're doing something cool, and uh, and they want to be a part of it. So, you know, I mean, the marketing side of things, if you don't have a blog, um, you know, maybe you're not a writer. Well, just talk to people. Word of mouth is awesome. So... Um, <clears throat> yeah, I thought, you know, some people do this, like, one million tricks to starting such and such, and they sell it for forty dollars. And I've thought about doing like a course on composting. I may do that in the future. But I thought for the mer the nursery book, I'll just give you guys all all the information that I did, how I did it, and and make it funny too, and put in a bunch of photos. It was really kind of a fun book. And um, you know, so there you go. I just decided to um, to just go for it. So yeah. <laughs> Popular David, the good quotes. You never know what will succeed unless you try it. And also, hey, I'll just ask for ten bucks. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, how did you find a landowner? Okay, moving on to property with no money. Uh, we bought the property that we own, uh, that we have here. The other piece of the other piece of property that we were borrowing, they just were happy to have it cleared, and they're friends, so. Um, air layering or seed to propagate low quads, definitely seed. And then if you had a very good variety of grafting, low quads are super easy, super easy to graft. Yeah, elderly Florida couple forced to stop growing vegetables in the front yard. I've covered a couple of stories like that in the survival garden. I hate that kind of thing. I feel like if it's your land, it's your land. Um, Flyover Pilgrim, we loved your new book. We've been considering a nursery for about a year now. We're going to jump in. Oh, it's cool. Thanks. Uh, sent by Preacher's Day Off. I'm not sure who that is. I'll have to look, look, look him up. What are the easiest fruit trees to grow in Zone 6? Um, I find pears very easy to grow. Some people say that apples are easier. Um, you're right on the edge for peaches, but I would, I would give them a try anyways. Peaches, peaches grow quickly. Plums are very easy. Uh, the Chinese chestnut is very easy. The Dunstan chestnut is easy. Uh, there's quite a few things. And also... Um, Blackberries grow really well in that climate, so uh, mulberries will also grow. Mulberries are probably the very, very easiest. <clears throat> privacy hedge for Central Florida location. Um, if you want a really fast privacy hedge, Silverthorn. Silverthorn is the bomb. Uh, mm, it, that's like, funny. I wanted to give you a silver. Yeah, Silverthorn is awesome, and it actually has small edible fruit. You can eat it. Most people don't know that, but it grows super fast. It's very dense, and it's a nitrogen fixer. You can chop chop it down and prune it as much as you like and it will grow back just make sure you give it some space because it will get absolutely huge if you don't prune it you stay on top of it a little like don't plant it right next to your neighbor's fence like i did 
<laughs> they're really pretty though. They get quite large and they are sort of silvery. Um, and they're, they're dense. They're really pretty. Yeah. Yakan. Uh, I'm trying to grow Yakan, but not having much luck. Yeah, Yakan is um, Yakan is one of those things. It's uh, it really seems to like a lot of moisture and rich soil. I think it would like a little shade in Florida. Let's see. What else do we have here? Why did you guys move out of the United States? I have a few reasons. Uh, tropical gardening, and I think the United States is probably going to collapse with the next 15 years, though. I'll spread it around. Um, edible landscaping is a great business. That's a good niche. That's the weirdest fruit you grow. Probably, what would you say? Weirdest fruit we grow. Okay. Jackfruit's kind of weird. Jackfruit's really weird. Uh, Jabota Kaba. Probably Jabota Kaba. Do, do we we, we had a potted one. one. I had to sell it. Wait, wait, did we have it in Florida? Yeah, we had it in Florida. Did it ever produce for us? No, That's it was just about to produce. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Aki is another, that's another weird one. Um, the, um, here, okay. Uh, I enjoyed your videos on yams. I don't think the zone B growing season is really long enough, but second year I got a small crop of bulbils off the six plants. Well, that's very good. Uh, in that climate, you can grow Chinese yam, also called um, cinnamon vine, which is an in, it's an invasive species, actually, and grows up into Massachusetts, probably even into Canada as well. Bad drivers of Columbus, Georgia. I wouldn't recommend non-native L.A. Agnes. Yeah, it's too late. They're, they're out, so. <laughs> I, I didn't have any problem with them showing up anywhere else, but it's, it's possible that birds planted them, so if you feel bad about it, you know, don't worry about it. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, Noni is weird. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. I guess we are. Definitely. Yeah, we are growing that now. Um, I think, you know what, it's so weird that I mean, it's not even on my radar because it's, yeah. it's very weird. <laughs> yeah, Noni is very weird. I, I can't get Rachel to eat it. it. She yeah, won't eat it. <laughs> Though, uh, we, had some, we had some friends over and uh, the wife had never seen it before and the husband's like, here, it's a type of cheese. Just just eat it. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to tell you, what is that? What is that? Ah! And she was like, all the rest of the night, she's like, I didn't do it. Yeah, she was like that. I, I mean, it, it tastes... I, I, can't, I can't say. It tastes never... kind of like Limburger cheese and black pepper with like an undertone of vomit. The smell is... No, it's not. But I, I can eat it. No, you're not dumb for trying to grow peach trees from pits. I, I grow peach trees from pits. You're asking um, the wrong person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's awesome. They grow so fast. Um, you just have to stratify them in the fridge. Actually, one of my one of my better watched videos is how to start peach trees from pits. The um, they you just stick them in the fridge. Like you get the pit, you stick it in the fridge in a little bit of uh, slightly moist soil, and and chill it and Roots will start coming out in about three months. You put them out in pots or put them in the ground, and they will grow peaches. I had a peach tree in Florida produce a handful of peaches 18 months after growing from a pit, and the next one produced about two and a half years. So, yeah, they're awesome. They're very, very easy to grow. You should breed Noni to have better taste. I haven't found one that, that tastes better be to actually breed from yet. Yeah. Uh, yes, we could grow durian. I haven't seen it, though. It's probably more popular in... Uh, Grab your guitar. Man, the microphone on this thing sounds so bad. I, it's, you know. I get Rachel grab her uh, violin. She's actually pretty good at it. So, uh, anybody else have any more questions? I think I'm going to call it a night. If, um, if anybody has, I'll take a few more questions. If you have any questions from Rachel, she can ask questions too. How are the apple trees doing? That's a good question. We started some from seed. We had a lot of them died from rot issues, but we have one left. And my son, how old is he? Which one? Mm -hmm. It's Roger. He's uh, eight. He's eight. Yeah, eight years old. Eight, our, our, our eight, year, eight year old has been starting tons of them in the fridge. So, uh, what country are you in? We we don't answer. Um, just Central America. 
You want to see violin by Rachel? Yeah, uh, yes, we do use biochar. I like biochar, but uh, charge it first. Otherwise, you put it in the ground and it will suck up like everything for the first year or two well, until it gets charged up. By charging. Put it in some like. Uh, put it in urine or compost tea or something nitrogenous, fish emulsion, whatever, so we can just suck it and soak all that stuff up, suck it into all the pores of the uh, that stuff, and then it's like a slow release in the soil. Be cool. Uh, Flyer from Pilgrim writes, "Oh, Rachel, thank you for the pickling video. We love them. Oh, More food good. videos, please." Well, we're working on it, but I'm glad you like the one. Okay, bad drivers, go ahead and answer your question. Uh, oh, I see it. Did you have peach leaf curl with your peach tree in Florida? No, not really. Um, nematodes would chew the root systems up, but I would dump lots of compost around the base of all the trees to head it off. Yeah, I'll, I'll record us playing violin and guitar at some point. It sounds nice, because uh, I can play the harmony and she can play the melody. Cookbook, recipe book. Yes, it's on the list, Kevin. It's like one of those things we'll get, we'll get to do at one point. What happened to the old properties? Yeah, um, a woman uh, bought my property in North Florida and is still maintaining the food forest. I've been trying to get somebody to go by and take a video at some point uh, and post it. That would be cool. Good job, Danny. Please sing What If The Lights Go Out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was fun. Somebody said, you would like this song. And, uh, and he, he emailed me this song called What If The Lights Go Out. He's like, this is like a prepper song. And so um, I was like, I'm listening to it's kind of a hip hoppy song, so I turned it into a uh, I turned it into an acoustic guitar song. Rachel sharpening a knife behind me in time. You can see it on YouTube somewhere. What if the lights go out? It's an old video we did, and uh, and I sent it back to him. I was like, here's our cover. I was like, I liked it that much. Our old property in North Florida was between Ocala and Gainesville. Yeah, there's a lot of places in Central America. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of safe places and there's some not so safe places. It's and and it's good to appreciate the culture, appreciate the community, be a good guest. Don't don't try to force you know American stuff onto everybody and you know complain about what you had back home. Um, be friendly, you know, share plans with people. Yeah, we can of course. Oh, you bought some of my t-shirts. Well, thank you, Jimmy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Send pictures at some point. I'll post them on the blog. David at FloridaFoodForests.com. Thank you, Chip. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thomas. All right, guys. I'm going to call it a night. And uh, thank you all for watching. We'll try to do this more often. And I'll see if I can figure out the Super Chats thing. I don't know why the Super Chats don't work. But um, that would be really cool. Like, just make money for talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask for 10 bucks. Have a good night. Until next time, your thumbs always be.